<clears throat> Thank you all for, for, for coming. Uh, it's great to see uh, uh, you all again uh, for this session. I remember we ran a session like this in, uh, in Parliament, uh, I think just over, just over a year ago. And it was a very, very different time. Uh, uh, the, the Commission had just uh, uh, presented its uh, legislative proposal. Uh, and on the other side of the on the other side of the pond, uh, the uh, FCC ruling uh, hadn't uh, hadn't come in. So uh, now we're looking at a very diff uh, different picture, um, and I, I really look forward to to explore this uh, uh, today. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank also uh, Martin Schalke for for hosting the session uh, uh, today, uh, despite the uh, despite the security. Uh, requirements in the department to uh, make our life um, and so it's a bit unfortunate we had to uh, uh, restrict participation to uh, uh, people who already have uh, participation uh, but uh, we really try to have these sessions as, as open as possible so we have the possibility also of uh, interacting online through, uh, through Twitter uh, the hashtag is uh, NNEUUS uh, six letters uh, we're, we're filming also this, uh, uh, this session and we'll be putting up a, 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 a link uh, uh, to that. Um, and, uh, and, and we're uh, using also a white paper with the conclusion to this. Uh, uh, um, <clears throat> a few words about uh, Open From Academy, uh, if you don't know us. Uh, um, Open From Academy is a, is a think tank program that is uh, um, dedicated to exploring the, the, um, the openness uh, 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 paradigm shift in, uh, in the ICT industry in uh, all shapes and forms. Um, so we have, a, we have a network of uh, over uh, 40 fellows, uh, which are all experts in different, uh, 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 in their uh, respective uh, areas. I think actually we have, uh, well, we have uh, uh, one uh, today, uh, uh, F. Timos, who's, uh, who's going to be uh, drawing up the, um, uh, the white paper uh, for this meeting. Um, and we run uh, sessions like this uh, um, in Parliament and outside Parliament um, every, every um, couple of months or so uh, to try to uh, hash out some of the uh, challenges to uh, 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 policy discussion. Um, we're, uh, uh, we're firstly independent, we're strictly uh, not for profit, but uh, as we, as we uh, often say, we're also not for loss. And so uh, uh, we, we have to look for, for uh, sponsorship on, a, on an individual basis for these events. And so uh, I'd like to thank uh, Google for uh, helping me make this one uh, possible. Um, a few words about how we're going to run this session today. So um, uh, um, I'm going to hand over in, a, in just a couple of minutes to Martin uh, Chaka to say a few words. Um, and then uh, we will let Jennifer uh, Baker uh, introduce the speaker and, and moderate the session. Um, and, uh, um, so as I said, we have a, a uh, to the hashtag, you're welcome to uh, you're welcome to tweet. Uh, the presentations of the speakers is uh, is uh, um, is going to be filmed. It's going to be public. Uh, we like to have our Q and A session under chat and house rule. Uh, we think that is uh, encourages a, a more uh, uh, open discussion, and so uh, uh, feel free to uh, 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 quote people, but please don't uh, please don't attribute. Um, and I think I think that's about it. So uh, thank, you very much. thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here at this early hour for a very important discussion. <coughs> excuse me on on net neutrality. Uh, I think the timing could not have been better. Uh, we are really um, uh, witnessing the build up to a very important decision, uh, namely what the Council of Ministers is going to do uh, with regard to their stance on uh, the telecoms package and so to have the opportunity to discuss with such uh, distinguished experts taking different perspectives and expertise on this on this topic is, is really great 
Um, as a member of parliament, I've been working on this issue since 2009 when I was first elected. Uh, a little bit of background perhaps to shed light on why I think this is such an important topic uh, for the open internet and for the future of Europe and the digital economy. Um, I'm from the Netherlands and uh, the discussion on net neutrality was sparked there when during a shareholder meeting of our uh, major telecoms operator, previously state-owned uh, telecoms operator KPN, one of the board members uh, explained to someone of the shareholders uh, asking about competition from voice over IP services, what the solution could be. Throttling, blocking, and all kinds of other uh, ways out. Uh, and this, rightfully so, sparked a major discussion based on two main elements. One, the um, looking into data packages. How would the telecoms operator know what you as a consumer uh, are doing, which sites you're visiting, and which you are not? And the other discussion, uh, takes a Dutch person, I suppose, uh, was more about why free services were not made available by telecoms operators. And although the discussion was sparked by KPN, it was soon uh, clear that this was a common practice by all telecoms operators and after uh, my party, D66, initiated uh, to have this enshrined by law, uh, the Netherlands adopted net neutrality by law. Uh, in a majority in parliament, not controversial as the first EU country, not European country, I should say, in the presence of our Norwegian friends. Um, and I think it is, it is uh, really um, uh, oftentimes misunderstood and, and net neutrality has been misrepresented here in the EU on a number of occasions. Um, some people, we see this also <clears throat> in the United States, notably on the Republican side, present net neutrality as over-regulating the open internet. Even though uh, I think as a liberal and as anyone who believes in free markets and fair competition, rules are necessary to have fair competition and net neutrality is such a rule that is necessary. And practice has shown this. Because up until today, and the initial thinking of the previous European Commission was that transparency on the um, terms of use and competition between telecoms and internet operators uh, would ensure this fair competition, that rules were not needed. But the practice shows, practice uh, revealed by a major research by the uh, European Consumer Rights Organization, that up until today, millions of Europeans do not have access to all uh, sites on, on the World Wide Web because blocking and throttling still happen today. So I think we have to keep the consumer and the internet user uh, central in our minds when we talk about net neutrality. But we should also think about future-proof legislation. Uh, if we do not have clear rules on net neutrality, what does it mean for the opportunities of the innovative startups that we cherish in Europe, that we would like to see thriving, uh, and that now may not have the opportunity to get capital, uh, to have a fair chance to compete with the major players uh, in the market. So, for the sake of consumer rights, for the sake of innovation, startups and job creation, and for the sake of uh, fair competition, I think net neutrality is very important. Now, I was very excited when uh, the telecoms uh, single market package was announced and uh, uh, that net neutrality was one of the pillars. Uh, but we needed to do quite a bit of work here in the European Parliament to sharpen the definitions, to make it much more clear what is net neutrality, and also what are specialized services in order to have clear rules of the road in going forward. And the European Parliament supported these more clear definitions uh, in a majority, uh, and uh, uh, we are now actually uh, faced with another fight. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, um, proposals that we see coming out of the Council, both when it comes to net neutrality and when it comes to ending roaming charges, are disappointing to an extent that they are nearly insulting. Uh, if we promise consumers, internet users, to end roaming charges, and we strive to do so by the end of this year, 2015, then the suggestion to give 5 MB for free every day uh, is, is you know, an infinite distance away from that ambition. Uh, 5 MB is um, uh, 30 seconds of uh, high quality news, a minute and a half in low quality. Uh, the um, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody wants. Uh, or sending four high-quality pictures by email. So that is hardly uh, the kind of ambition that we need, 
And so uh, yesterday um, I, I circulated a letter among uh, colleagues here in the Parliament to call upon the Council to really be ambitious for the sake of having a good, solid telecom single market package uh, and also because the telecom single market is an essential building block for the digital single market that everybody talks about but that will not materialize uh, if, if procedures and decision making uh, are so complex and if ambitions are so low. What I fear, and I'll end there, is that if we're going to uh, have a major fight over roaming charges, because the gap between the Commission and the Parliament and the Council is so great, that net neutrality could be snowed under and could be pushed off the agenda effectively, uh, because of course ending roaming is very popular. It was one of those promises that did make people uh, excited about the European elections, about the added value of Europe, and we cannot let citizens down. Uh, and the same goes for net neutrality. I'm happy to see that there's movement in the United States, quite unexpectedly. We're still waiting for the details, and the devil is always in the details. Uh, but I still strive to see European leadership um, uh, with a Dutch uh, example that shows uh, how, how this can be done uh, in a 21st century way. Uh, but it needs hard work and we're not there yet. So I hope that today's discussions can contribute also to the understanding of the technicalities, um, uh, these, these details that are so important, and uh, uh, that we can work for an ambitious telecoms and digital single market in Europe. Everybody knows it's needed for jobs and for um, setting ourselves up for, for the future in an increasingly competitive world. Um, I really... Uh, I really um, I think the need is great, uh, but I'm very disappointed to see what is happening on the side of the ministers. Thank you very much. Um, so we have about an hour now, and we're going to try and fill that time mostly with discussions and we'll try and get some answers that will, will help feed back into this, uh, this paper. Um, but I will introduce the panelists and give them you know, a few minutes just to sit out your opening comments and thoughts. So at the end here we have Antonio Stossos, who's the managing partner of WeWheel. Then Kevin O'Brien, the Comrade Sharon, but also representing Beric, for each of course you all know. Uh, Fulda Sorensen is here from the Norwegian Communications Authority. And uh, Jens Henrik Jensen is the European Director from the Centre for Democracy and Technology, who I've warned him is the closest thing we have to someone coming out of the US, because we don't have anyone here representing <laughs> that side, but uh, they do, of course, have not so much of that. But uh, let me start. Antonius, would you like to kick off and just give us your opening thoughts? Thanks a lot for yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Alpha, for inviting me uh, to speak uh, about net neutrality uh, in this event. A uh, few words about Rewheel. So we are a Helsinki-based, Finland-based uh, consultancy, telecom consultancy. We specialize in uh, competition. We talk about pro-competitive telecom strategies, which is not that obvious always. Um, and we tend to say things that nobody else says in the industry, so I will also say a few of those things uh, today. Uh, the presentation is long, um, there is 10, 11 slides. Uh, I would probably just touch on a few of those slides, uh, they will be public, so you will, be, uh, you will have the opportunity to actually uh, read through. Uh, but the most important point that I would like to, to make um, uh, throughout this uh, net neutrality discussions for the last two, three years, uh, we bring some uh, different angle, you know, we, uh, and we brought that angle because we came to the net neutrality discussion from somewhere else. Uh, we, we were looking at prices, price of mobile internet in Europe, and price of mobile internet in Europe vary greatly, vary by a factor of 100. So that is not 10%, that is not 50%, that's 100 times different. Uh, European consumers pay from one market to the other in, uh, in order to access uh, mobile internet. Uh, so, uh, is, it, is it possible how to, to move the slides uh, forward? Uh, how do I do that? Yeah, I have to tell you. Yeah, I can see also that the entire slide is not visible. But uh, so, basically, the question that we ask uh, is that. Um, do we want competitively priced mobile internet access in Europe, or do we want telco vertical discriminated, for example, zero-rated video and tile services? Um, so, we move to the next slide. Uh, 
here we try to, you know, describe very uh, in a very simple language, you know, what net neutrality should be about and what special services are about. So we see three uh, three main uh, uh, attributes of net neutrality. We see that shouldn't be any technical discrimination, what we call blocking, throttling, and uh, pay prioritization deals as well. Uh, there shouldn't be any price discrimination, and that's. Uh, I will say even more important than the technical discrimination, and will tell me why. Well, because technical discrimination, for example, blocking and throttling, will never fly. It is not possible to actually block a service that consumers want to access, and operators will get away with it. You know, this is simply there will be an outcry if you cannot access a service or if the operator is uh, interfering with the quality of the service that the consumers are trying to. So. It, with all regards and all the discussion that happened in the U.S. about pay prioritization deals and fast lanes, we do not really believe and we have not seen uh, real market examples of pay prioritization deals. Operators in the U.S. have said they are not interested in pay prioritization and fast lanes, if you want to believe that. Uh, however, price discrimination is all over the place. Price discrimination is happening and it's sitting net neutrality today. And I will say a few words about that. Uh, specialized services, so it's everything that is not internet-based, and there is many examples of that. I will not talk about uh, connected cars and uh, health services, because this is new stuff that they haven't come yet. But there is specialized service already that operators are offering. And for example, voice and SMS, legacy voice and SMS, is a, it can be considered a specialized service, a voice over LTE and uh, other similar type of services. The important thing over there is that, of course, operators should be able within the broadband capacity pipe to do other stuff than internet. I mean, they shouldn't be forced only to offer internet access through that broadband type. The real question is that if they do offer non-discriminatory internet access, net ne neutral internet access, they shouldn't use special services to undermine that internet access, and I would say, how do we uh, propose to, to handle that next time? So the big issue for us is volume gaps. And uh, why volume gaps? I, I would like to bring you a real market example from Finland. Uh, on the upper uh, left, uh, left side, you will see my um, uh, mobile data consumption, mobile data consumption of February, which was 40 gigabytes. So I did 40 gigabytes on my smartphone plan, 25 euros unlimited smartphone plan from Elisa. So in Finland you have three operators, Elisa, uh, DNA, and Telia Sonera. Two, two out of those three operators offer truly unlimited uh, smartphone plans with 25 euros. Uh, you could do as many gigabytes as you want and there is no tethering restrictions, there is no application restrictions, no whatsoever, and no fair uses whatsoever. And the third one, Telia Sonera, offers for 30 euros 50 gigabytes. 30 euros, 50 gigabytes smartphone plans. If you run out of gigabytes, and you do run out of gigabytes, they sell additional gigabytes at 0 0.2 euro per gigabyte. Now, these are real prices from a market, Finland, where it has the highest penetration of mobile broadband, where it has the highest mobile data consumption per capita. It has reached now at 4 gigabytes per month. <coughs> In Finland, so everything does four gigabyte every month on their mobile internet subscriptions, and obviously, zero rating and net uh, net neutrality is not an issue in Finland because if you, if you have an unlimited mobile uh, broadband mobile internet subscription, then obviously there is no much to zero rating. Now that was Finland, and then we go to see Europe, and we see a great huge difference on the price of mobile internet across Europe. From Finland, where actually gigabytes are sold at below 0.2 euro per gigabyte, to Greece, where gigabytes cost 70 euros per gigabyte. And we have, all, you know, several times for the last two, three years, keep uh, uh, reiterating this message and asking the Commission, when will the Commission start measuring mobile internet prices in Europe? We do measure fixed broadband prices in Europe, but why not mobile internet prices? Uh, the FCC commissioner, commissioner just uh, uh, tweeted out that 55% of access in the US happens through the mobile networks. So why are we not measuring mobile internet access prices in Europe? Next slide. 
And the issue of zero rating, uh, we have uh, uh, in the digital fee monitor a service that we will publish is a measure of prices and as well discriminatory uh, uh, practice of operators like zero rating. We have counted something like 92 zero rated services uh, that mobile operators offer in OCD uh, at October 2014. Here's just a small snapshot. This uh, focuses on uh, a video, this focuses on mobile TV and film stores that uh, mobile operators in Europe have launched. And what we are trying to show here, we are trying to show that zero rating is about the price of open mobile internet access. You remember Delia Sonera mentioned in Finland 30 euros, 50 gigabytes, additional gigabytes is 0.2 euros per gigabyte. So people can watch as much Netflix, and I do as well, in Finland as they want on their mobile internet connections because it is affordable. So there is no point of discriminating your own film store because just people who watch Netflix or who watch anything else. However, in all other markets in Europe, as you see, where operators have launched zero rated film stores and zero rated own. Uh, video services and TV, people cannot actually watch other alternatives because it's just too expensive with their open mobile internet uh, uh, subscriptions. So in most cases they cannot actually buy even more gigabytes. So operators are not selling to the consumers more gigabytes. Now how does that add up? So you could only buy 5 gigabytes. But no, sorry, I will not sell you more. But I want to buy more as a consumer, but I can. So the, the issue over here is that if this is allowed, clearly operators will be favoring their own video uh, services. And in a way, they will be foreclosing open internet video services like Netflix, Vimeo, and Pluto TV. Although Netflix, as, uh, as we uh, probably had, uh, had got zero rated in Australia. So you see that it's not that uh, straightforward, even the um, oh, over the top uh, video internet providers are somehow in a kind of that dilemma. If they don't get zero rated, then they will not be favored. So the pressure is very big for them. Just the list of the 92 uh, zero rated services in OCD. And just to conclude on zero rating. So zero rating in our view is anti competitive. It causes con consumer harm because it restricts consumer choice and competitive harm because it plays competitors at a disadvantage. The flip side of zero rating, and we wrote an article, a, a story about this, you know, and this is very important. Zero rating is throttling. So what zero rating does, it is actually a, a universal throttling of all other services except the service that is zero rated. Because the one, once you reach your cap, all other services get throttled, but not the zero rated services. So it's actually a, a different way to throttle things, you know. We spoke about this, uh, that mobile operators have a fundamental conflict of interest in selling both open internet access and their own services. You know, please, it's, it's pretty straightforward, think about it. If you both try to offer to the consumers open mobile internet access as they do in Finland, then you have an interest to actually have gigabyte prices that is affordable for consumers because they, otherwise they won't be able to use it. But if you also at the same time try to favor your own services, then of course it makes a lot of sense to try to make consumers to be able to buy open internet access. Uh, if zero rating is not one, mobile operators are incentivized to set low volume gaps pretty straightforward in order to enhance the appeal of their own zero rate services. Buying zero rating, zero rating leads to lower mobile internet access prices. After ACM in the Netherlands uh, uh, filed Vodafone uh, for zero rating, HBO and KPM uh, for, um, uh, for some voice, uh, voice over IP, KPM came out with new tariffs for the same amount of money that consumers paid before. KPM doubled the volume allowance and said we do that because we want our customers to enjoy free video pretty clear. But if you zero rate, then they could still enjoy your free video, but it would be your own video. So th there is evidence already out there that zero rating, banning zero rating is actually increasing mobile competition of, of open internet. And uh, finally, we say that net neutrality rules that do not ban price discrimination such as zero rating will be toothless. Um, difference between uh, 
US and EU in terms of zero rating, I will say a few things from the stuff that we know about uh, the FCC rules. Uh, three bright line rules, no blocking, no throttling, no pay prioritization, zero rating and price discrimination is not included in the bright line, uh, bright line rules of the FCC. It will be dealt under the open uh, internet contact standard on a case by case when a complaint is filed. However, FCC senior officials said, as reported by Bloomberg, when they were asked about zero rating, that at the moment their view on zero rating is the following. Zero rating on or affiliate content is probably not okay. Zero rating content, third party content for a fee is probably not okay. But zero rating third party application or application classes, the way that T-Mobile US is doing it with uh, the uh, zero rating music streaming services, and T-Mobile has said that they want to include all music streaming services with a zero rating, that's probably okay. Yes, because that's probably non-discriminatory. So in that case, uh, the, that, that service won't be uh, discriminatory. In Europe, though, the price discrimination proposal from some small member states doesn't seem to go anywhere, as we heard earlier, and the big member states are not very happy with that. One final uh, word about uh, specialized services. So in that illustration, as you see over there, you, we try to illustrate that there is license, and I repeat the word, public spectrum. Spectrum is a public asset, and it has been licensed to operators. So operators with that license spectrum, they could offer open internet access, but also they could offer specialized services. Now the question is that they should be able to offer specialized services. However, the question is how much of that spectrum should be dedicated to open internet access, and how much of that spectrum should be dedicated to specialized services. And uh, the, the, the Parliament um, uh, first reading back in April 2014 uh, had a way to deal with that by trying to allocate priority to open internet access over specialized services. However, we feel that that's not enough. We feel that it would be better if specialized services are provisioned over dedicated frequency. Because once they're there, provision of a dedicated frequency, then they, you could not actually interfere with internet access. So for example, new specialized services like health, uh, health services and connected cars could be, uh, regulators could allocate dedicated spectrum for it. And then there is no issue whatsoever, there is no issue with discrimination whatsoever. Operators could do whatever they want over those dedicated frequencies. And one last point. Um, you do not need specialized services to offer uh, higher quality of service, dedicated uh, quality of service, higher speeds. You could offer all these things, you could offer fast lanes on a non-discriminatory manner by having net neutrality. And I could say more if, if you wish about that later, with the details about that. One, one, one last point, and I will not elaborate, but I will say that if zero rating is not banned, we see that becoming a new uh, barrier to the single market. And uh, the, the logic is very simple. The logic is similar to geo-blocking, uh, meaning that uh, if, if one service, if I get a zero rated Netflix in Belgium, the question that I will ask is, how would I watch my Netflix if I go to Germany? If that operator doesn't zero rate Netflix in Germany, I won't be able to do it because it will cost 300 euros to use, to, to, to use it uh, with open mobile internet uh, prices. So zero rating will act the same way that zero blocking is acting. It actually segments the markets in, in many smaller pieces and we believe that it will be possible with uh, vertical, uh, vertical um, uh, discrimination such as zero rating to, to achieve a single telecom market. Sorry, I thought, I thought there was quite much, you know, for 10 minutes, but that's all. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I guess we'll be coming back. There's tweeting, people have been commenting a lot, so we'll come back and get some more questions. But let's move on. Kevin, um, you're going to give us a regulator's point of view. Um, presumably that's quite a challenge. Um, it can be a challenge to give a regulator's view. I suppose it's probably more of a challenge to give a view of 28 European um, member states which make up BEREC and we do have uh, uh, other 
Superman is from the EEA and Observe is a Berwick, so I can't remember the exact figure, but we have something like 36 or 37 participants in Berwick. Um, there are many views on the net neutrality subject within Berwick, and they often reflect what we know the various member state views or the various member states and council views might be. So sometimes you have uh, you know, the, the proxy wars happening in Berwick. Um, spilling over from, from the council or elsewhere. Um, so what I thought I'd do this morning is to set out at a high level where, where Berwick is on the matter. Uh, delighted we have, you introduced us as experts, I think everybody here would be except for myself on net neutrality. I'll, I'll say a little bit about the, the extent to which net neutrality comes across the regulator in, in the day-to-day -day sense in a few minutes, but I am delighted that we, we have Berwick's Number one experts in, in Florida, and you will be representing the uh, Norwegian view, and I think that's good because that, that means he'll be free to <laughs> he'll be freer than I am, I think, to, to, to give his expert views. Um, woke up this morning, I set the alarm on the, uh, the TV in the hotel for 6:45, and it came on BBC World, which I've been watching the day before, and the news was on. They were looking at the papers, and they were talking about banks. They're always talking about banks and TV. And then the next thing they were talking about net neutrality, and I was kind of going, this is, you know, you don't see much on TV on net neutrality, except perhaps in the last seven or eight days, and it's very interesting. And there was a headline in one of the British papers, which um, I didn't quite see which paper it was, but it talked that there was now a, a, a cross-Atlantic divide or a cross-Atlantic split in relation to the, the issue of uh, net neutrality. And the host of the show said, oh, the FCC made a decision, and I thought the rest of the world would follow suit, but it looks like Europe is going a different path. So that was, that was the same by this morning at about 6.45 on BBC World, which I thought was, I thought was interesting. Just back to what I said, um, the day-to-day -day world of the regulator. In, in Ireland, in Comrade, we, we have had to do very little on net neutrality. I mean, that's the... the there have been a couple of examples that have come to our attention where uh, there was uh, Skype blocking by a mobile operator. Um, and we, we did some investigations into that and then the operator gave us some excuses and so on. And we, did, we didn't go further and um, there was not a lot of choice in the market at that point in time. Um, so I already talked about roaming earlier. I mean, roaming is something a regulator can talk about until the cows come home. We've taken compliance cases on roaming. We do reports on what's happening in, in the Irish market in relation to roaming all the time. We can talk about broadband access, universal service, but net neutrality is challenging because we're, we're kind of talking about the future rather than the present. And I think that's the, 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 the big debate. And William Berwick, I mean, at, at, again, at a very high level, there are an awful lot of NRAs that are on the view that this is, this is too important for the types of issues that Antonio has talk, talked about um, to, to gain a foothold that would fundamentally change the, the open internet experience and people should act now. And then there is the other view that choice for the consumer will solve most of the problems. And that once you have marketplaces where there is choice, then competition will, will, will drive away the problem. So they're, they're the kind of two different, uh, at, a, at a very simple level, the, the two different positions that we see within Berwick. Um, I just mentioned the issue of subsidiarity of, of, of local rules versus pan-European rules, because what, what we have in the existing framework is a sense that regulators can implement local traffic management monitoring, can uh, look for examples where they think the, the, the spirit of the framework has been breached and intervene. Um, but what you have then is a, a, a kind of an approach based country by country. And again, as Antonio said, the, 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 that produces differences across Europe. So that, that, that's one of the big questions facing policymakers today. Um, Maybe I'll just run a little bit through what Berwick has been doing since 2009 on this issue. Just say a little bit about what Berwick is doing at the moment in terms of its, its work, its detailed work on net neutrality, but also where Berwick is positioning itself and where Berwick has to position itself 
uh, in terms of engaging with the council, with the commission, with the parliament on, on issues such as net neutrality where legislative proposals are, are, being, are being made. Um, just since 2010, Berwick has done an awful lot of work through its expert working groups on all of the issues that have bubbled up in this net neutrality debate. You can see that on the Berwick web website. So we've done a lot around frameworks for quality of service monitoring. We've explored the transparency issue in detail. Um, we have looked at competition issues and whether the competition pressures solve problems and we've looked at the incentives of uh, both network operators and over the top players or content and application players and what the incentives are and the pressures are in the marketplace around these net neutrality issues. Um, just at a very high level to, to mention some of the findings that Berwick has had over the last last number of years, which you, you'll find set out in detail in all of those reports. Um, there's a view that it certainly will become important and is important that um, monitoring of traffic management should happen in member states. Um, that this is something that needs to be observed, needs to be explored, needs to be reported on. Um, there's a real possibility that regulators would have to introduce minimum quality of service standards. Um, another very observation goes back to my first point really is that in a lot of member states, NRAs have not really discussed net neutrality because it just hasn't come, come before them as an issue. Um, whether it should have or not is, is a different point. Um, plenty of evidence of um, from time to time avoid blocking and uh, person-to-person -person file sharing being, being throttled or being prevented and so on. Again, there are different statistics that Berwick has published based on questionnaires in relation to this. But uh, at a high level, there, there's plenty of evidence, and again, Tony mentioned this, where, where operators have prevented certain services being made available. Um, a Berwick observation is that these problems have often gone away when there has been focus, when there has been discussion, when the NRA has gone and talked to the operators, talked about the issue publicly. Um, across everything we do as a regulator in Ireland, and again, Berwick will talk about it all the time, is the issue of transparency. The theory is that the more the consumer is informed, the more the consumer is empowered, then in a competitive market, the consumer will make choices that will, will drive away um, behaviours that are not in the consumer interest. That's the theory. I might say a little bit more about the experience because it, it does vary. Um, there are kind of new challenges emerging in Ireland is one of the countries where we have had a four to three mobile merger. Um, Comrade last year when the merger was announced stated its disappointment with some aspects of the Commission decision in relation to that. Uh, Berwick last week held a workshop on oligopolies and regulation uh, in the oligopoly markets and certainly the net neutrality issue in, in an oligopoly scenario is, is one to be considered. Um, Berwick generally stays away from industrial policy. We don't have a remit to promote industrial policy in Europe. In fact, one of our criticisms of the European Commission, uh, particularly at the beginning of the Connected Continent proposals, was that the European Commission seemed to be moving away from seeing competition as a, a way to benefit the European consumer and European businesses and, and tending more towards industrial policy. Um, However, there's a recognition within Berwick that an open and free internet has to be a cornerstone for any continent's digital industrial policy. So that, that is recognised uh, by Berwick. Well, one other comment is that third parties, I mean in Ireland and across Europe, we will have the classic is the switching site. You go somewhere where it tells you where you can get cheaper electricity or gas, or it tells you who will give you your, your broadband and your TV cheaper. So again, from the work where it is done, a recognition that third party analysis um, can inform consumers and help them choose products where any net neutrality issues might be emerging and that they're informed and can choose alternatives if those alternatives are available. Briefly to say what um, 
Peric is doing at the moment, uh, we, we are engaging with the various European institutions on the Connected Continent package, I'll say something about that in a moment and how we do it. Um, but maybe three pieces of work that are underway at the expert working group level. Um, we're looking at, the, at the, we're doing a feasibility study on opt-in monitoring system for Europe. So this could be through Beric, a European system for monitoring in relation to quality of service. And um, we're also doing work on ecosystem dynamics and demand side focus. So we're looking at again the consumer demand competitive pressures and what that might mean for the future in terms of uh, net neutrality issues. And we are doing further work on traffic management investigation. Um, so I said I'd come back to what Beric is doing in terms of our engagement with the legislative making process in Europe. We, we are not, we don't create legislation. Beric is in fact a creation of legislation in the 2009 package. It's important for the group of regulators that we're seen to act under the existing law. Uh, we come together under law with a view primarily to ensure better harmonization across Europe and to share best practice and so on. Um, so we are cautious when we comment on the work of the Commission and their proposals, when we engage with the Parliament, when we engage with the Council. Um, however, we do do it, and um, we've done it recently in relation to roaming, and we've done it recently in relation to net neutrality. So if I was just to say what we're saying to the Council at the moment, the kind of key points Beric is making when we see the current Council proposals is to ensure good quality and clear definitions. Because as a regulator, the worst thing in life you can have is loopholes. The worst thing in life you can have is legislation that seems to aspire to protect the consumer in a certain way, but when you try and implement it, uh, you find that it's not clear and it won't stand up in court, or indeed it's written in a way that the loophole is so obvious that the operators might circumvent it effectively from the word go. So there are certain things in relation to the definition of internet access services. There are certain things in relation to the uh, debate between equal and equivalent services. But Berwick is providing commentary to the council at the moment. And our view, uh, and that's our combined view of more than 30 organizations on what we think uh, could, could be done slightly differently. Um, so again, we're, we're sharing that. Um, in conclusion, I would say two things. I would highlight the importance of transparency to the consumer. This runs across all of what uh, regulators do. But I would emphasize that transparency alone is, is often not sufficient. I mean, the, the general approach to switching is something that European regulators have worked on for, for more than 10 years. And while it exists in theory, I, I can assure you that if an operator wishes to make it hard for consumers to switch broadband or switch mobile, they can do it. And we've taken significant compliance cases in Ireland that were very difficult to get a result from, but we did eventually over time. So transparency and the ability to switch alone are, are, are good but they're not necessarily a panacea. Um, as regulators, we need good tools. We need tools that are clearly defined and tools that work. So that, that's a big message from us. What, whatever the policymakers land on with the European approach to net neutrality, it has to be one where regulators can implement it and can uh, have proper enforcement powers. And um, as I said, get the definitions right. And um, I know it's problematic because people are coming from different linguistic perspectives and so on. If it takes longer because of that, uh, so be it. But having clear definitions so everybody does know what we're talking about and at the end of this process what is legal and what is not legal is clear. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've already heard from Marietje, so we'll skip now to the floor to not in the EU but uh, Norway has in Europe one of the, the longest running net neutrality um, so the legislative basis. So you can give us a more narrow view, I guess, than, uh, than Kevin's been talking about. 
Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is really in the morning. It's the earliest meeting I've ever had in Brussels at 8 o'clock. <laughs> if it's a good morning, it depends on how well you slept this night, of course. Um, yes, I will uh, represent uh, the Norwegian youth. Um, I'm also chairing the BEREC working group on net neutrality, but my views expressed here are, are strictly the ones from the Norwegian regulator, uh, NCOM. Uh, first of all, uh, a quick uh, look into the Norwegian view on the next uh, slide. Um, NCOM has had a co-regulatory approach to net neutrality. Uh, we launched Norwegian guidelines to net neutrality in 2009 and it's the longest running uh, regime to net neutrality in Europe. Uh, I want to stress that it's a co-regulatory approach, so it's neither a law nor uh, a self-regulatory approach. So when we say co-regulation, it's the regulator together with the industry who has developed these guidelines. Uh, this means that uh, uh, clearly different from a self-regulatory approach, uh, which typically will only uh, focus on transparency issues, for example, where operators can uh, inform consumers about which services are blocked or funded in their offers. Uh, the co-regulatory approach in Norway has uh, produced guidelines that are rather comparable to uh, the Parliament's decision in, in 2014, containing transparency, of course, uh, but in addition to that, they uh, allow specialized services they are clearly non-blocking and non-throttling uh, rules and we allow uh, reasonable traffic management to, to some extent. Taking a, a broader view on the next slide, um, I tried to compare the European approach to the new published uh, FCC rules uh, and uh, as long as uh, the only fixed uh, position we have from Europe is the Parliament's position. I use that uh, as a starting point, uh, and I suppose the discussion today will also touch the Council's uh, movements. Um, comparing those two approaches, we can see clearly that uh, non blocking and non throttling is uh, rather similar on both continents. Uh, and on the US uh, side, we have this non prioritization uh, in addition, which has not been touched and neither in, in, in Parliament's version or in other versions uh, in Europe. Regarding specialized services, both uh, continents have uh, some approach regarding that. I'll discuss uh, soon uh, the details, uh, some of the details that we have been discussing in Europe, uh, and there are clearly similar details that, that are relevant for, for the US approach, but I don't know that so much in detail, so I will not go into that today. Furthermore, since uh, zero rating has been uh, high on the agenda uh, recently, um, it's also interesting to see how this is handled, and we can see that the FCC, uh, at least their, uh, the message we have heard so far, uh, indicates that, that they can, can approach zero rating on, on a case-by-case -case basis, the so so-called standard for future conduct. Uh, and also, interestingly, they have uh, in, in included some aspects regarding IP to connect, where we can see uh, similar effects that we have regarding net neutrality can also, to some extent, be, be, be uh, um, used in the market uh, regarding uh, interconnect uh, issues. Uh, I would like to discuss uh, a little bit in detail two topics. Uh, first of all, the specialized services on the next slide. Um, specialized services um, are introduced uh, as an extensive exception uh, from net neutrality. That should be very clear. So when Barrick, for example, in their guidelines in 2012 introduced this concept, it was in order to have a clear opening for operators to uh, launch, to, to provide services uh, that uh, do not need to adhere to the net neutrality um, rules. Uh, 
But in order to, at the same time, have this opening for, for special services and also uh, protect net neutrality, uh, there are a couple of aspects that are very important in, in order to, to preserve both aspects. Uh, and those two uh, sub-points are mentioned on this slide are, are quoted uh, from, from the Barrack uh, documentation. Uh, so first of all, it's important to have uh, a separation between the Internet Access Service and the Special Services on the network layer. That means the traffic is separated for those two services. You don't need to build two networks. In order to do that, you can use uh, so-called virtual networks to do that. Uh, the second aspect that is important is, of course, that uh, the specialized services must not be provided at the expense of the Internet Access Service. This also relates to, to the, the, the clarity of, of uh, net neutrality provisions discussed in Europe today. <coughs> uh, we have seen discussions uh, in Europe uh, receiving arguments from, from both sides uh, in, in the discussion, uh, and uh, we've seen uh, some strange comments regarding uh, the protection we need of specialized services. Since specialized services already have built-in quality of service mechanisms, they don't need protection from the internet access. Uh, it's the other way around. We have regulation of net neutrality in order to protect the internet access service. That should be very clear. This is the Norwegian view, anyway. <clears throat> Moving on to, to the next um, main point I want to make regarding application agnosticism, uh, where I also will touch this zero rating uh, discussion. Uh, application agnosticism is uh, the traditional way of working for, for the internet. Uh, and you can also see uh, how, how um, um, we, we can, in, in the broad line, describe what net neutrality is based on this concept. So, um, and then this also um, uh, is a way of uh, answering the concern we hear from, from uh, the operators that they are not uh, able to differentiate their services. Uh, and and uh, there are clearly two ways of differentiating uh, the product line uh, uh, without uh, breaching the net neutrality, and this is based on access speed uh, or data volume. Data volume is, is typically used in, in the mobile networks. Uh, any differentiation based on specific content or applications would uh, constitute a breach of net neutrality. And this also explains uh, in one way uh, how uh, we can consider the zero rating uh, discussion. In case of zero rating, uh, specific content or applications um, are given, uh, are, uh, they are favored uh, where the providers choose this favoring instead of the end users. Uh, so in, in the Norwegian view, the end users should uh, decide how they want to use uh, internet access. And, and finally, uh, a short uh, element regarding this application agnosticism. If there is a concern regarding quality of service from operators, first of all, uh, you can provide quality of service based on specialized services. That's, uh, as I explained, a, a very explicit a exception from that neutrality. Uh, but also, in addition to that, it's actually possible to have a so-called application agnostic quality of service where the end user is in control of, of uh, this, uh, this uh, quality function. Uh, however, this idea has not been, been uh, included in either in, in the FCC or the European uh, proposed regulation to, to net neutrality, but it's definitely a possibility and it's uh, explained in detail, in particular, by, by Barbara von Schellig, in case you want to study this topic uh, further. Finally, uh, concluding on my last slide, um, why is it so difficult to agree about uh, net neutrality? 
Is it because uh, we don't understand the value of the internet? Or is it also to some extent because we don't understand how the internet works? I don't have an answer to that, I'm just uh, asking the question and, and a couple of uh, elements to, to consider in, in that regard is that the internet is completely different from the traditional telecommunications uh, uh, and, and there is also some uh, word of games uh, going on in the discussion uh, regarding whether uh, we, we should protect uh, innovation based on that neutrality uh, or if innovation should be done internally in the network. Um, I, I acknowledge both uh, the need of both, uh, but on the other hand, uh, re reverse engineering telecoms into IP, uh, I don't think that's uh, particularly innovative, uh, actually. Um, furthermore, uh, trying to describe the, uh, the essence of how the internet works. Uh, the internet applications are decoupled from the, uh, the underlying uh, network, which is completely different from specialized services, uh, which are typically vertically integrated. And if we want to protect net neutrality, we, we need to, to have this independence so that uh, applications can be, pro be provided from, uh, from the uh, end, from the edge. Uh, from, from, from the, con uh, the consumer's equipment, the end user's uh, equipment. Uh, furthermore, the internet provides global connectivity and we should uh, try to avoid fragmenting the internet. The value of the internet is degraded uh, in, in case uh, there are blocking or throttling of applications on the internet, then the internet is actually fragmented. And finally, there is a need for a pan-European approach for net neutrality. We should avoid a situation where we have national regulations which differ uh, significantly from country to country. Uh, in a competition between, in market competition between the Europe and, and the US, uh, we should approach uh, uh, a connected continent, uh, as is the title of the ongoing legislative process, and we should uh, ensure a clear net neutrality protection in, in this regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I will move on straight away then to Jens Henrik. So um, you've got the challenge of speaking after everybody else. Uh, yes. Avoiding yes. that position is going to be the, the challenge for you, Henrik. Right, yes. So uh, thanks very much to OFE and thank you very much to Mauricio for hosting uh, this debate. Very timely indeed. Uh, CDT, the Center for Democracy and Technology, we're a US based organization. We have had an office here in Brussels for just about two years. So net neutrality has been uh, one of the core issues that we have uh, uh, that we have uh, argued uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. And I think Mauricio summed up the issue extremely well to begin with. Uh, I think the you know why this is so crucial. I think the only thing I would add to that is quote is a quote by Tom Wheeler uh, um, recently when he said that. Neither, neither governments nor corporations should interfere with what we as end users uh, choose to, uh, to access uh, on the internet. That is the fundamental principle that needs to be laid down in law uh, on both sides of the, uh, of the Atlantic. So, so we were extremely pleased, of course, uh, as many other neutrality advocates with the FCC vote and the draft order, uh, which we haven't seen yet. Uh, there's supposed to be 30, 300, 332 pages of it. Uh, but uh, uh, we're, ex we're excited about the stance that the FCC has taken. Uh, uh, it, has, it has really uh, tried to build the strongest possible ground to stand on uh, to, um, in order to, uh, uh, to, uh, to guarantee the open internet and, and maintaining uh, uh, the, um, the internet as, an, as a permissionless uh, innovation platform. Uh, which is what we have all come to appreciate and what, what is so crucial to inter entrepreneurship and, and democratic debate and discourse. So, um, so as we said in our statement, uh, uh, you know, this is a milestone decision, uh, but the efforts to protect the open internet do not end today. And, uh, and, and so, just very briefly on what happens next, uh, uh, Congress uh, has apparently decided uh, 
not to counter FCC with a legislative proposal. That was the latest news. But there is a very real possibility that uh, Congress will try to uh, defund uh, the FCC's enforcement activities. So they will try to uh, put forward legislation which will make it extremely difficult for the FCC to actually enforce uh, uh, an open internet decision. And then there is uh, court cases, uh, several uh, SPs and cable uh, telecoms companies in the US have said that they will uh, challenge the FCC's uh, uh, order uh, in court. So this is a very much an ongoing uh, debate, an ongoing battle. Now the, the issues, uh, as, as the presentations have shown, are very, very similar, um, uh, both in the US and the, East, and, and the EU, although the, the legislative and legal and, and framework, uh, the, the, they are completely different. Um, I think that the, um, uh, we applauded the commission proposal when it came out in, in 2013. It was not a given that it would come out. Uh, uh, it was not perfect, much work uh, needed to be done to, to, to strengthen that and, and I think we were extremely pleased with the European Parliament's uh, uh, amendments, uh, uh, the, the tightening of definitions, the, the, the tightening of, of language that, was, uh, uh, that the Parliament uh, uh, was able to introduce. Um, now, council, uh, we have uh, with uh, with other with colleagues uh, tried to intervene in the council in the council discussions and, and in the process. And I think uh, I'd be a little more optimistic than than many others, perhaps, uh, looking at where we are today uh, uh, relative to where we might have expected to be. Because if you look at the uh, the amount and the intensity of of opposition against uh, uh, against any sort of open internet net neutrality rule in EU legislation. Uh, I think it is, um, uh, you know, had, had, had somebody asked me in, in September last year whether we would have something like the text that we have from the Council in front of us today on net neutrality, uh, I don't think I would have uh, expected that. I, I, I think, and I, Absolutely, there are many, many open issues and uh, definitions that need strengthening, and there is uh, there is language that that needs that, need, that needs to be worked on. Uh, but I think that there was every risk that we would not get to where we are at this at this stage, and and so uh, uh, I'm hopeful that we will be able to to address some of the open issues in, in the negotiations between Parliament and the Council, and we'll certainly try to help there. Uh, if you look at the just a few words on the on the on the council text, clearly price discrimination and, and zero rating uh, has been a big discussion in the council uh, in the council working group. Um, and uh, as we understand it, the the, 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 the the square the, the circle that they tried to square is the 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 problem of uh, a number of countries who would not, and the Commission, who would not address uh, price discrimination in this proposal. Um, uh, and of course, wanting to make sure that countries can address uh, uh, price discrimination issues. Um, uh, not clear how you do that. And, um, and I think one very important question I'd, I'd like to have barracks and, and, and also uh, for those uh, views on that is, is whether the text that, that, that is on the table now that talks about commercial practices and commercial practices that may limit the freedom of, of, of users to, to choose, does that provide enough of a hook to stand from a regulator's point of view? Um, does it, it doesn't give an obligation clearly. Uh, but does it, uh, does it give enough of a, a, a possibility for regulators to intervene in those cases? Or do we need to try and, and, and strengthen and, and make those decisions clearer? Uh, another issue that is, uh, that is coming out of the, uh, of the Council text is, is that there's a lot of reference to preferred and use of references. Uh, we think that may be uh, that, that may be quite dangerous in the sense that, uh, as, as, as we know, we as, as end users and consumers, uh, we're not in the business of expressing a lot of preferences to our, uh, to our ISPs. We will generally have 
home service that is available to us, and, and that is what we will uh, be able to get. So we have to be careful not to let specialized services in uh, through the back door uh, by having users tick, some, tick a box somewhere and, and then have that be a tacit uh, uh, acceptance or a, or a tacit sort of uh, expression of, of, of a preference that the, that the ISP can then uh, use to, uh, to prioritize certain traffic over, over others. Um, other, so, so these are the kinds of um, of, uh, of issues that I think we need to uh, we need to work hard at as we move into into the trial, uh, uh, hopefully soon. So um, the final thing I wanted to uh, just highlight is the, the disappearance of specialized services from the council text. Um, uh, it is now known as services other than internet access. Uh, that's an interesting. I think we've had debates among colleagues uh, whether whether it is workable. I think we all prefer there be a definition. Is it? Can can we make the text uh, uh, strong and can we make it useful uh, even without a definition of specialized services? Anyway, I'll stop there. Well, actually, I think that's quite a good place to start our uh, discussion uh, part of, of the morning, um, which is, can it work? I mean, we've, we've heard some views on what's happening in the council. Obviously, we don't really know exactly what the final text is going to be, but um, Maritza, let me start with you. You mentioned earlier on that you think it's disappointing to the point of insulting. Um, what influence can you bring to bear on it? What, what do you want to see changed? Well, as I was listening, and I think that these were excellent presentations, so thank you so much. Um, it does strike me that, um, of course, some of these definitions are also interrelated. I mean, if there are very firm definitions on how net neutrality should be preserved, then that includes restrictions of specialized services. We in the Parliament had clear text on both, because we wanted to make sure that both uh, were clearly defined and, and restricted. Um, uh, and operated on the basis of competition amongst themselves, for example, equal treatment of specialized services, uh, putting specialized services in separate capacity, uh, things like that. But uh, I think the words of, of um, uh, Mr. O'Brien uh, from Vera could not have been clearer when he said we need clear definitions. And the ambivalence in the current council text is precisely what concerns me, because if it is uh, if, interpretable in many different ways, then uh, usually what we see is that the lowest common denominator is sought by those who benefit, so by uh, those who, who think that they can use their gatekeeper position in the market, those who think that they can strike special deals for zero rating, etc, uh, etc. Et so uh, what we can do now, and, and this fight is not over, but it's also not easy, um, is uh, make our voices heard. Yesterday I circulated a letter in the Parliament that we will send out today to all council members, which in one day uh, gathered 120 signatures, uh, and, and that's quite a bit, I've, I've done letters before. Uh, this Parliament is very keen to see clear definitions of net neutrality. It was adopted by the previous Parliament, but it is clear from also statements related in other contexts. Uh, we recently had a debate on the uh, Internet Governance Forum of the United Nations, it's a different topic. But many, many speakers in their debating interventions <clears throat> mentioned the need for EU leadership and strong definitions of net neutrality. Uh, the same goes for roaming, of course. Um, we do not want to see our citizens disappointed by these kinds of proposals. And so this fight is far from over. The trilogue will start once the Council has taken its position and there will be votes uh, on the final proposal. Um, but all in all, the fact that this is so slow, that the proposals are not forward-looking, but really stuck um, in the <clears throat> previous century where certain incumbents had a position, and those incumbents also happened to be quite close to some of the member state governments, some of them being shareholders of these companies, I think really makes this a um, uh, very um, unbalanced kind of discussion that we must change. Uh, again, I thought a very good point that was made is that this is more about the future than about the present. We already see the problems in the present. If we don't address them now, the future uh, will not see a Europe that is as um, uh, encouraging of innovation. Um, I, I forget who mentioned it, but the comment was made that actually, um, oh yeah, I think it was Antonius who said, 
uh, innovative services cannot be blocked. Well, they may not be blocked or people may find a way around it, but before they are well known, they need to attract investment. If the investor thinks that the service will not see the light of day because of practices that are common and also allowed in the market, then it may not be blocking de facto, even though that still happens, uh, but it could be such a discouragement that we hamper innovation. And if there's anything that we need in Europe, it is those startups that create, to create jobs. It is those, those companies that, um, uh, that would strengthen the digital single market. So all of these issues are very much intertwined. At the heart of it should be clear definitions. We're, we're very uh, supportive of that. Um, and, and hopefully uh, we can still get somewhere once council understands what is really going on and how important this is for people. Well, you're talking about definitions. Um, let me sort of ask, at, at the Mobile World Congress, which is going on in Barcelona as we speak, um, Nokia CEO said, you know, completely rubbish net neutrality. He said, you know, it's a neutral internet is ridiculous. Some IP packets are simply more important than others. And, you know, we have heart monitors that need to be, you know, it, it, it was framing the debate in terms of you're going to be in trouble, citizens, if you try and enforce this neutral um, traffic management playing field. Do you think framing the debate in that sort of way is one of the problems? Let me start right up uh, at the other end there. Uh, yeah, I think it is um, actually useful to try to uh, explain, uh, Frode uh, spoke about it. It is possible to offer quality of service on an application agnostic way. Uh, Professor Valskevic has uh, described it uh, uh, very nicely and Nokia knows it and that's why I would say it was not at all uh, helpful um, uh, Nokia CEO statement because uh, they are very well, very well aware of how to do this. Just to simply say, it is uh, you will have SIMs, and this is happening today. Mobile operators have VIP customers, where with SIMs with priority. That means when there is congestion, those SIMs take priority, and that's perfectly okay because it is a, an end user type of discrimination. As you have discrimination in terms of higher speeds, high volumes with low price per gigabyte on those volume packages. So all these things are are possible today and, and can be done. I, I would like to make one note, uh, take the opportunity to make the following note. If we presume that we are trying uh, to prevent specialized services uh, from uh, undermining the capacity of internet access with the current proposal on the table, we should be careful in one thing. And that is that without price discrimination doesn't work. Why? Because if uh, uh, gigabytes, if the volume capacity, if you cannot use the volume capacity, then you will, you can actually uh, prevent the operators to uh, assign the volume capacity to specialized services rather than assigning the volume capacity to internet. So if gigabytes are too expensive to buy on the open internet, then automatically that means the capacity, the gigabyte capacity goes to specialized services. So you can really put in uh, in work that proposal without touching, as Brother said, speed and volume as well. Does anyone else want to pick up on, in reaction to those uh, statements from the uh, Mobile World Congress? Okay. Uh, just a, a very general point that um, where societies consider something to be or when you mentioned a health application. And something we do is we regulate the emergency call answering service in Ireland, as many operators do. And we uh, set the price and we, we look at quality and so on. So, I mean, there, there is, but where societies think something is particularly important, I don't think there's any problem with society intervening. You know, the, the phrase where lawful is used a lot in these kind of debates. So society can produce other laws to solve specific problems. And um, I don't think um, suggesting that net neutrality uh, would get in the way is, is, is the, right, the right approach. There are other approaches for society to deal with those issues. Well, one of the questions that came in on Twitter here is uh, it's from the CCIA, the Computer and Communications Industry, um, asking, why, why is the EU more comfortable following the US lead, uh, we need net neutrality? Um, 
do you think the EU is following the US lead? I mean, the timing would appear at the moment that they are, but, but is that just a coincidence? Mirti, you're shaking your head. No, I, I really don't think so. I mean, uh, we've been working on this for years, uh, and, and if the Council, for example, were to look at the US, they would not come up with these kinds of proposals. So I think it's a bit um, of an artificial comparison. I do think it would make sense uh, to look for how together we could go for um, a global push for net neutrality. We are dealing with worldwide web after all, and uh, uh, my first priority is to get it right in Europe, but if we can uh, look to the rest of the world, that's very important. So in that sense, I think it makes sense, but again, we still have to see what the details are of the US proposal. We, we've heard in all of the presentations, and we're very much aware that the devil is always in the details. So the, the vote of the SEC is one step that still has to go to Congress. There will be uh, potential for challenges otherwise. So we're, we're not there yet. Uh, not here in Europe, not there in, in the US. Um, but uh, uh, you know, my, my key priority now is to see Europe going in the right direction. And it's not a US direction, it's a net neutrality direction. And then else want to compare the two? Well, I, <clears throat> just picking up on the, on the uh, point about non-EU and US uh, context, and, and uh, CDT had a panel at IGF in September on this, um, and it's, it's a very, very different discussion in those countries often because uh, it's not a question of having a neutral or an open internet, it's, it's, it's a question of whether there is access to anything at all. And, and then these types of, <clears throat> of deals between big content providers or applications providers and uh, operators become much more, um, they, they become irresistible <laughs> in the sense that you, know, you get a deal between uh, you know, Facebook or, and various operators and there is a sort of walled garden, there is a you know, low cost access to a number of, <clears throat> a number of services. That, Clearly not something that that uh, that uh, doesn't. It, it clearly violates net neutrality principles, but it's a completely different discussion if you're in a developing country. Uh, that, that's important to note. And I would also say that just based on the discussions with the council, working group members, there are there's as you know there are very big differences between uh, you know our countries in terms of broadband rollout, and there are countries that don't see this as their primary problem because they don't have the you know, the broadband capacity in, in rural areas and so on and so forth. So, very complex, but I'm, I'm really interested to hear, uh, if, if I may, uh, some views on, on on the price discrimination issue and, and whether, what we need to do with council text to make it useful to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to counter you know, the kinds of practices uh, that we're seeing all over, all over Europe in the marketplace. You know, is, are, are there, do people have good suggestions about that? Well, actually, we do have a little bit more time. We thought we were going to wrap up the time as we've got a few more minutes before uh, we have to go and get something to eat at this early stage. And um, so, I'm going to open this up to you. If anyone does have comments or questions, just uh, do raise your hand if you want to jump in and, and uh, maybe take up Vince's uh, suggestion that we should uh, sort of look more closely at the council documents and see what specifically could be changed. Anyone? Uh, just a quick comment uh, to Jens Henrik's um, questions, uh, comments um, regarding uh, the Council's proposal. Uh, we have these commercial practices, uh, which is mentioned, but of course it's it's very uh, general and, and uh, unclear. So so uh, I, I don't see how it can be used uh, as, as as a regulatory tool to to. Uh, and zero, zero pricing, for example. But of course, uh, the problem in Europe is that uh, there are different views in different countries, and, and I expect that it will be very difficult to achieve a compromise regarding zero pricing for the time being. My main concern, actually, uh, in, in, in the continuation of, of the legislative process, is more related to uh, how clear the definitions are, uh, and, and you also, uh, yes, Henrik mentioned uh, the aspect of um, that specialized services are not, uh, no longer explicitly mentioned in, 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 in the text. Uh, and I don't regard that necessarily as a problem, uh, as long as uh, the text is clear. 
but uh, I uh, I'm concerned that uh, it will not be clear and, and that in fact uh, the so-called specialist services or the non-internet access services uh, might be uh, provided at the expense of the internet access and then actually we are achieving prioritization on the internet and it's not at all net neutrality in the end. Thank you. I would say that uh, the situation in Europe, because of 28 national countries, is a bit more complicated than uh, in the US and the difference in pricing and the difference position of the operators in different countries makes things more complicated. But uh, one note in this, um, referring to the how to, to achieve the digital single market, which we need the single telecom market first. We fight hard to create um, um, non-terminating monopolies in mobile specific, I would say, and we are more or less you know, uh, in a better state today than we used to be. So customers could switch from one mobile operator to the other easily through number portability and uh, with, uh, with uh, few, few limitations. What will happen when mobile operators vertically integrate? Each one of them will uh, select uh, a menu of uh, services and application which they will price discriminate if they could, you know. So what that means, it means that it creates a new terminating monopoly because once you are a customer of, let's say, Movistar, and Movistar, let's say, at zero rates Netflix. So you want to leave Movistar and you want to become a customer of Base. But Base doesn't zero rate Netflix, maybe Base zero rates HBO. So you won't be able to take those services with you to the next operator. That's a kind of a new terminating mon monopoly and it, it doesn't have to happen across European countries, it could even happen within one country. So once the customer signs up to specially price discriminated services, that does not exist in another mobile operator. That means that the only way to switch an operator is to leave those content and services that you had from the previous operator and get a new one. And we can really, this, this basically balkanize experience in the internet, you know, because you can have the same internet experience in another in another operator and I would be I would be keen to hear the operator's view on this on this one. Well one question just to pick up on that that came in uh, on Twitter is asking uh, whether net neutrality would be a problem if there was more competition. Um, and I, I was recently at a, at a GSMA event where they suggested we have far too much competition in, in the Europe and, and it would be fine with just two or three operators. Um, can I get your reactions to that? Also, maybe comparing between fixed and, and mobile access. Well, I mean, I think the discussion about competition and net neutrality is a bit of a chicken or the egg. Um, if we look at the current practice, we see that there is uh, discrimination and lack of, of competition in many ways. Uh, because there is a lack of choice for consumers, um, uh, that's an issue. So um, I think we should look at the whole um, offering of services and, and not just distinguish between, uh, let's say, telecom operators and internet service providers, because telecom operators are internet service providers and offer telephony and, and messaging services, which are actually <coughs> decreasing. So. Um, I think it's a bit of an, an artificial uh, comparison uh, and if you believe in the principle of competition you have to ensure that it is upheld with whatever is necessary and uh, net neutrality rules that are clear are one option but of course antitrust and uh, other, other measures that the EU has at its disposal must, must also be used to ensure that this competition uh, is fair. Anyone else want to? Just one quick comment on the difference between fixed and mobile. Um, obviously, mobile speeds are improving all the time, particularly 4G rollout. However, there are different networks and uh, traffic management requirements. Traffic, uh, the engineering is different. But I don't think that, that beyond, beyond that statement, I don't think it's particularly relevant. You can still have application agnostic approaches uh, in mobile as well as in fixed. So. The, the, the end, people must appreciate that there's different engineering required with congestion and so on, and with cellular based services. But, but, but I don't think it's 
too relevant for the, the core principles of rate net neutrality. Yeah, one quick comment about it. Um, competition is about access revenue. So more competition, than, you know, in access revenue, of course, it is better. And uh, it, you know, one could say as well that it uh, does make the net neutrality case better because the more players, the, the more the possibility there will be a player that will be willing to offer net neutral access. However, uh, net neutrality is not about only access revenue. It is about access revenue and content revenues, and that's why competition alone in access revenue would not necessarily remove the incentive of those players in the access uh, layer to actually go as well for a share of the content revenue. Sure. Okay, any comments or questions from anyone else in the room? Just stick your hand up. Okay, uh, well, Maggie Sat, I'll ask a sort of final question about getting this sort of with 28 member states, it's going to be a bit provocative to you, Marie, which is, should the, should the Netherlands have gone ahead and gone alone unilaterally before we had an EU-wide net neutrality rule? I mean, we've already seen fines for, uh, for Vodafone and others in, in the Netherlands. Is, is that a problem? Would it have been better if all EU member states had come at this uh, together? In an ideal world, yes. Having had net neutrality laws uh, enforced and in place for years already across the EU would have had my preference. But uh, without leadership, uh, there's not much that can happen. And uh, I think that we were perfectly uh, legitimate to address the concerns that we found uh, in our market. And uh, it is actually uh, all the more disappointing that while the practices in other member states are exactly the same, uh, the leadership from those governments is not uh, as strong. So I think that Dutch leadership uh, and, and you know Norwegian examples as well as later initiatives by other countries in Europe have been instrumental in getting to where we are. Um, and um, um, in that sense, I'm, I'm happy that we, we took the lead, uh, but it's, it's become, of course, more important to see it happen um, in the EU so that we can preserve a level playing field that, that uh, ensures a future-proof regulation to foster not only the telecom single market, but also the digital single market. And that really, um, you know, the, the gap between the ease with which in speeches and in, in press releases, everybody promises to deliver this digital single market. It is sort of the pet project of everyone now. The European Commission has it as a priority. It is supposed to create an endless amount of jobs and growth, and I believe that there is huge potential. So I think it is indeed important to prioritize this, but, but take that and compare it to the um, actual level of ambition, the difficulty of decision making, uh, the lack of willingness of member states to go beyond uh, what they perceive as their own interests is really, really worrying. Uh, not only for the, for the digital single market, but really for where we want to go as a European Union, as a single market. And uh, in that sense, I think that this is a quite a decisive moment, and therefore we have to work to get it right now, because it would help pave the way for further important developments. Okay, I'm going to ask each of you to do quickly sum up, but also to give me a, a, a final sort of one or two word prediction whether the, uh, the US decision will have an influence on what the Council is doing and whether that may be positive or negative as you interpret it. And so we'll first. Yes, well, <coughs> first of all, beautifully summed up by uh, Marietje. I, I, I fully support that. And on the, um, I think there, there is going to be, and I think it's part of our job to make sure that there is going to be a, an influence uh, and, and that the uh, the decisions uh, taken in the U.S. will continue to uh, to play a role in, in the European debate. <clears throat> I think it is it is crucial to uh, to uh, underline that this is about this this is about innovation and uh, uh, and as as well as as fundamental rights, and that this is really central uh, to Europe's future uh, and, and the, uh, the successful, hopefully. Uh, a rollout of the digital single market. It will not happen without an open neutral internet. Uh, the internet is global and, and uh, the discussion about uh, net neutrality uh, also tends to be global. We, we have the FCC and, and, and European debate but also other countries and I think Europeans are, are looking abroad and in particular of course to the FCC and I think it can have some influence on the European debate, yes. I think it can and I hope it will be a wake-up call.
I think I said the first thing I said was maybe Charlie was on the news this morning, so it's, it's made it very topical. I think it's brought focus to it. And at a, at a soundbite level, there seems to be very clarity in what the FCC is saying. And I suppose the very message to the legislative uh, legislation makers is to produce clarity. I think there is, uh, after the 10th of November, I think it was 10th of November 2014, when President Obama made that statement, there is no turning back after that. It will, it's a matter of time, but net neutrality will become uh, law, uh, I believe, in the US and EU in some time. Okay, thank you all very much for that. I quite like those uh, last summing up, so very concise. And thank you very much, of course, to Open Forum Europe for hosting us. I hope it's been really informative for everyone. And we should have, I believe we have uh, uh, some breakfast served outside, so you're welcome to just take around if you want to do the chat outside. Oh, and of thank course, you. continue the chat online on Twitter. Use the hashtag NNEUUS.